Where's my car? Oh, yeah, it was stolen. What? Big guy, very attractive. Yeah, he took it, it's gone. Uh, very attractive. I saw his whole body and, and his beautiful face. You know, I could, you know, definitely identify him, definitely, yeah, um, because it took a while, you know, to turn on the car and he wanted to pair his phone to the radio, maybe he had a playlist. He didn't think to, like, say something? Oh, no, I, I didn't think about that. Derek, man, we're neighbors. We're supposed to be looking out for each other. Yeah, the, the world's ending, so I said, who gives a f anyway about any of this, sh you know? 2 a.m., asteroid hits, and then I, I'm gone, gone. Yeah, yeah, we're, I mean, you know, we're all, we're all in the same boat here. Why do you need a car today anyway? We have some very big plans for the day. Yeah, we had a day. pretty epic day plan that could have really used a, a vehicle. Yeah. All right, then we're gonna, uh, I guess we're gonna hoof it. Okay, hoof away. Okay, man. Hoof away. Well, it is a beautiful day to walk. Hey guys, here's my interview with Daryl Wine. He's a co-director and co-writer of How It Ends. And the other co-director and co-writer is Zoe Lister-Jones. Zoe Lister-Jones is, is the lead in How It Ends. She plays Liza, a Los Angeles denizen who is spending her last day on Earth. In fact, it is everyone's last day on Earth. It is an apocalyptic comedy. Yeah, it's it's a very sad thing that the Earth will, will be over. It, it's good, it, that's the title, how it ends. It's going to be kaput after the day is finished. And even with all those tragic stakes and I guess the inevitable sadness of it all, this movie essentially is a comedy, okay? And it, it was this movie was shot in July of tw uh, 2020 right at the beginning or is it the middle i i don't know anymore of of, the, of covid so that was that was a definitely a challenge to shoot this indie comedy slash drama overall i believe the movie works i, I really love the movie and me and co-host find your film co-host bruce perky sings its praises on our podcast and i'll have a link where you can actually listen to listen or watch that podcast where we talk about how it ends for further information. But this specifically is my interview with Daryl Wine. This is the first movie of his that I've seen. So after watching How It Ends, I definitely want to watch more of his work. Really interesting stuff from him and Zoe Lister-Jones. Loved Zoe Lister-Jones in this movie, as well as Kaylee Spaney, who I think is a star in the making. Also, if you're a big fan of Sharon Van Etten, I hope, hopefully I said that correctly, she makes a cameo. She's one of the many cameos in this movie that really stand out. Her her cameo really stands out as well as Hel Helen Hunt's. Helen Hunt is perfect in this movie. She plays the mother of Zoe Lister-Jones's character. So yeah, there's a lot of things to love about how it ends. And if you're really into, into filmmaking and creating, just, just creating stories, I think this is, even though it's 10 minutes, this is a pretty solid interview with Daryl Wine. Hopefully you, you enjoy it. Also, if you are a fan of this movie, if you really enjoyed this movie, we talk about the ending of the movie, Daryl does. He talks about the final moments of how it ends, and that video and audio is housed exclusively for our Cinematics Patreon members. I'll provide a link down below where you can access it. I apologize. That was my that that was my uh, computer saying something has just processed. That is my latest podcast episode. That is just I'm trying to compress the the, the file the size file. You don't need to know that. But anyways, you just need, I, my, my most important thing is hopefully you'll enjoy how it ends. If, tell, tell me what you think of how it ends, if you love it, if you hate it, whatever. And leave your comments below on the movie or if you've seen Daryl Wines' other works, okay? So hopefully you enjoy the movie. Hopefully you enjoy this interview. If you do like these interviews and all the movie co coverage, please like and subscribe to my Deepest Dream YouTube channel. Thank you so much for your support on this channel as well as listening to the podcast that I that I co-host, Cinematics, and Find Your Film. That was a mouthful, and I, I was probably very, yeah. So in, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much. Again, thanks again so much. Take care and enjoy how it ends. I hope you do enjoy it. All right, take care. Bye, Daryl. First off, I'm gonna I say this right off. Really loved your film, but I'm just gonna start off with a film geek question. There's a there's that I, I guess. Is, I don't know if it's a trope or just this saying that now with the digital era upon us, you can one can just pick up a camera and you have your Mac, you can, you know, these Mark cameras, everything. It's easy to shoot your movie and get it out there. That's the myth. But you're actually, you've been in this world 
for quite a while. You you are a director, producer, you know, you DP your stuff. What is the real truth behind that? Is there is there something that people aren't getting as far as like, yeah, it's there's a lot more democracy in picking up a camera and you can do your own thing. You can actually be your own filmmaker, but there must be a flip side to that as well, because as far as just getting your film out there. I think it's true. I mean, anybody can go pick up a red camera or a Alexa, Alexa mini or a, a FS7 or Canon C300, even a Sony A7S and make a movie. I mean, it could be a feature film, it can get into festivals and it can get distributed with very few people as is evident by this film, which I only had a crew of four people because of the pandemic. And all you need is a story and good actors and a vision and know how to put it together and you can make it happen. That's always what I tell young filmmakers that are starting out. That's what I did when I was in my early twenties with my first film, Breaking Upwards just went out and made it and cut my teeth by experimenting and just trying to do it on my own because it's so hard to get something made. The flip side to that is just, it's challenging, you know, from an emotional and financial and physical level when you don't have a lot of resources and a lot of help and, you know, the system is what it is. So it's harder to navigate getting your work out there. But, you know, if, if, if it's, if you put a lot of passion and belief into it and there's quality there and you submit it to film festivals, it, it will find its way and people will notice you. Daryl, can you make this happen? Because a couple of things. I was wondering on, again, another film geek level, the walking and talking scenes, does that rival probably the, are there more walking and talking scenes here than, the, than before sunrise, A? And B, as a filmmaker, can you just get this, set this in motion with Zoe and Kaylee just doing movies for the rest of their lives together because they work so <laughs> well? Can you make both those? Yeah. yeah, so just wondering about those. Thank things. you, I appreciate that. Well, yeah, I know. This might be the most walking in a film ever. I mean, I don't know. We'll have to do a side-by-side -side with Before Sunrise and After Sunset and see if they compare. But, you know, due to the nature of the pandemic and the circumstances we were in, we wanted to design a film that would work uh, within those parameters. So coming up with the, the concept of walking on your last day to your last party through LA, which is a city that nobody walks in, <laughs> we thought was a fun concept. And also we wanted to show LA in all its glory, its empty streets. Um, and I waited um, for cars to pass by and people to leave the frame so that it felt really stark and, and static and, and still. In terms of, wait, what was the second part? It was, oh, just you, oh, Kaylee and Zoe, yeah, they're yeah. amazing together. Yeah, they worked on the craft legacy. And so they've already had a great chemistry and relationship. And uh, yeah, Kaylee's like family now. And so hopefully we'll do many projects with, with her in the future. And Zoe and her as well. Yeah, Bob Dylan is referenced, I think, quickly in, in your narrative. And <laughs> I think of this Bob Dylan song, I believe it's My Back Pages, where he says, or he sings, I was so much older than, I'm younger than that now. And mm -hmm. I thought that was a very sublime theme with how it ends. Can you just talk about your the, the inner child and realizing that sometimes, even though that inner child does need love and nurturing, sometimes that inner child can actually be stronger and braver than the adults we become. That's really true. I think as children, there's almost like a bright eyed invincibility to the way one conducts, you know, themselves uh, at that age, you know, look, people have different upbringings can be really tough as well. But as kids, you know, until the world starts setting in and affecting you, um, you know, you're kind of googly eyed and just like, yeah, whatever. Like, I, okay, this, I want to go do that. I want to meet this person. And I don't know. You just, there's just like a youthful exuberance. Um, and yet at the same time, you're affected in so many ways and um, very impressionable and vulnerable and still forming. Um, and so many things that happen to a young person affects them for the rest of their life. And they don't even realize it at the time. You know, one thing someone can say, you know, you're stupid, you know, can make someone feel less than for the rest of their life um, or not hearing I love you um, makes them feel unloved and unworthy. So 
I think for us exploring the inner child and the inner self was important for that reason. That's why we wanted to have Zoe's character in dialogue with her younger self. Um, because there's a part of everyone, uh, their younger inner child, um, that gets neglected that, that, um, you know, wounds that haven't been healed and it's important to look at them, you know, later, but if you can, if you have the ability and the wherewithal and the energy and the bravery to, to go into that pain and, and, and look uh, at the darkness, um, to help, you know, create a fuller, more wholesome self. You just talk about the day of the shoot with, with Sharon, because I really love that song, that Sharon song, uh, 17. It really also in a, in a weird way, along with the music here, yeah. dovetails in what, into what you guys are talking about. What was that day of shooting like? I'm assuming it was a day. And that must have been such a sublime moment for it. It was amazing. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Sharon Van Etten is one of the greatest recording artists, um, you know, out there. And you know, we had a private concert with her. Like she wrote that song for the film and it was, it was, it was first time she was singing. It was on camera and uh, it was just so beautiful and, and emotional and moving. And, um, and yeah, just a really special moment in the film to, to, to vocalize, you know, those feelings um, and sing them Um Sometimes there's only some things, certain things that can can be said, um, and she has an incredible voice. So I, I, I have nothing else I can say other than it was just like such a treat and um, unique experience to have that happen. You know, uh, regarding one's voice, and I, you know, after watching this, Daryl, I, I looked back on your your filmography, and I have to say I haven't seen a lot of your movies, and oh, but thanks. each of the well, but each. Gotta watch them. <laughs> yeah, I gotta watch them. I gotta watch them. But I think what's interesting about them is that they don't follow a, a certain trend or what's hot at the moment. It seems like you've always followed your own path, no matter what the finances dictate. And I'm just wondering where that kind of bravery and integrity um, came from. I appreciate that. It's a very meaningful statement and insightful um, of you to to pick up on that. I it's not always easy, you know, it's just like, I, I just want to keep creating and making things that speak to my heart. And sometimes they're really challenging, like, you know, making consumed. Um, my third film was a political thriller tackling, you know, the food industrial complex and big corporations who process our food and genetically engineer it and do who knows what to it and how that affects farming and our food pipeline. And, that was very challenging. You know, we had a lot of odds against us and um, it's a tough type of subject matter. And, you know, Blueprint, which is another film that I made, that was very, I was very passionate about, a uh, small film um, with an all black cast set in Southside Chicago uh, about the aftermath of a police shooting, you know, came out of everything that was happening with Black Lives Matter and seeing so much systemic racism and unfortunate circumstances happening out in the world and wanting to lend my voice to this, to that um, movement and struggle and, and shine a light on unseen issues and stories that are sometimes unpopular, um, but things that we need to look at and think about and pay attention to. And that's always what's driving my storytelling is what is interesting and unique and that I want to see. Yeah. I yeah. do a movie podcast and this is a horrible, impossible question, but you, you know, you have, your, you have your hands dipped in so many parts of filmmaking. So I'm assuming you're a huge, huge cinephile, but right off the top of your head, can you name a film that's still, it's not, it's not just one of your favorite films, but it still speaks to you today and it still resonates with you. I way. love Being There by Hal Ashby. I just, I, I'm riveted by the tone of that film and the performance and just like how people misperceive his intentions in such a clever way it's, it's like he's such a comes from such a purely good place i just find that film so deeply funny um but also profound about uh you know the world um in in wanting to like he you know he uses that garden metaphor constantly like you know you gotta <laughs> water the garden and then in springtime the flowers will bloom and and i and everyone's like this, yeah, that makes sense. Um, but they're not seeing it themselves. And sometimes like just going back to the basics, just like simplicity 
is so important as we live in such a world that's so much noise and, you know, we're, we're so um, mired in, in digital detritus and, and political turmoil. And, you know, there's so many things that are um, flooding us at every, every second. And so I just, I really love that film for that reason, uh, because he's just like a simple man living in a chaotic world. And yet he's like making a profound difference. So I guess I'm assuming, lastly, you're a, you're a huge Ashby fan, maybe? You've liked his yeah. other movies. Okay, cool. Thank you so much for your time, Daryl. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thank it. you. I appreciate it. Okay, take care. Taylor, thank, thank you. you. Yes, thank you both thank you. so much, guys. Oh, one more thing. White Rabbit, I can get that on VOD because that's one of the things I want to work backwards. I can easily get that. on. Yeah, yeah. All my films are on iTunes. Oh, done. Yeah, okay. they're mostly, uh, they're, yeah, they should be everywhere, so. Okay, Thank you. Great. I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. Take care. Thank you. Bye guys. Bye-bye.